Okay, yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah, my, my talk, How to Cut Away, Live Your Dream, and Program Ruby Motion Full Time. Um, so, cutting away is a parachuting term where uh, when you realize your main parachute that you've deployed after a skydive is uh, it's not working correctly, right? That's not a good thing. Um, you basically cut it away. It's, um, you don't actually cut the lines, but you, you pull a cord and you just cut it away, and then you deploy a secondary parachute. And um, my, my talk is uh, subtitled, How to Quit Your Job and Love Every Minute of It. So uh, I'm going to be talking about basically how to quit your job, how to plan for your future, and how to, um, how to make RubyMotion or any other technology of your choosing part of that. So I'm Mark Rickert. Uh, I, uh, I run a little company called Off the Grid Apps. Uh, and then I also work at Infinite Red. Uh, and this is a photo of me taken earlier this morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, the bad boy of Ruby Motion. <laughs> so I, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the inspiration um, for what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I was at um, a hacker convention in Las Vegas called B-Sides um, in uh, 2013. Uh, and you can actually see the presentation is recorded. Uh, there's the YouTube link right there. And it was, uh, it was a talk by two guys named uh, Bo Woods and Taylor Banks. Um, they basically talked about how they were kind of hacking their lifestyle to do what they wanted to do and to still be able to maintain their quality of life and even increase their quality of life. Uh, one of them decided he wanted to work really, really hard for six months at a time, and then he would just go travel the world for the other six months. Uh, kind of like what Amir does, he just like works for six months and then goes and does his own thing for six months and comes back. And, and so he'd save up a bunch of money at the beginning and then just go and travel, do what he wanted to do, and uh, maybe pick up some odd jobs along the way. Uh, and the other guy, he was uh, working on building his business so that he could move to Costa Rica. And so he had done in intensive research on uh, cost of living in Costa Rica, and he was starting to build a online store. Uh, and he had goals set to where, when he started to reach a certain amount of revenue, he'd be able to move and sustain the lifestyle that he wanted in Costa Rica with his wife. So I thought about it for a while. Uh, and I love Calvin and Hobbes. I grew up reading them in the Sunday comics. And uh, change is invigorating. If you don't accept new challenges, you become complacent and lazy, and your life atrophies. Uh, and Paul, I believe he had to leave already to go back to, oh, there he is right there. I told you I was going to reference your talk. Um, he basically said, uh, he had a slide that said, life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. Uh, and I want to add something to that there. Um, if you don't step out of your comfort zone and face your fears, the number of situations that make you uncomfortable will keep growing. Uh, and so I decided um, to start thinking about how I could get out of my comfort zone and how I could uh, make my life better by, um, by basically trying to, to grow my, my sphere of experiences and traveling and interactions with other people. So I came up with a list of things I wanted. I wanted to travel. I want to see the world. I wanted to skydive. I love skydiving. I wanted to meet new people. I wanted to, because like, I feel like if you're not meeting new people, you're never uh, gaining new ideas and understanding new cultures. Um, and that's one of the reasons I love to travel. I wanted to live more simply. Uh, I had always had a ton of stuff, and I started to pare down my stuff, and I started to live more simply, but I wanted, I wanted more simplicity. I wanted to live greener. Um, I would uh, I take 20 minute showers all the time in my apartment. I would uh, I would make produce tons of trash. And as I have become older, I've realized that that's not a great thing for me to be doing in my life. And so I wanted to live a greener lifestyle. I wanted to have some awesome adventures. Uh, after this, I'm going to Stockholm for three weeks, and just just because I want to have an awesome adventure, and I've never been there. I wanted to make a good living doing what I love. Um, and that goes back, to again, to what uh, Amir was talking about before. It's about, it's about having meaningful work and uh, providing value and receiving something other than money. And skydive. <laughs> so, I, so I started to think, 
well, how can I do this? I can't really do this. I'm tied to a desk. Yeah, we had a great work from home policy. We had great vacation time, but I couldn't really do what I wanted to do, uh, which was travel and, and meet new people and, and have awesome adventures and, and still have my 40 hour a week, uh, nine to five job at a desk. And so I decided I was gonna be a quitter. And quitters aren't, being a quitter isn't, isn't a bad thing sometimes. Um, sometimes being a quitter is a good thing when you want to introduce change into your life. So I was thinking, how do I quit my job to achieve the lifestyle I wanted? And when people think about quitting, um, the wrong way to quit your job, <laughs> right? Nobody, no, nobody wants to burn any bridges, right? Um, you want to leave a company in a, uh, in a manner in which they would be happy to have you come back. Right, and I, I feel like I did that with my when when I uh, when I left my full time job, um, but this is the wrong way to quit a company. The right way is like getting on a boat, right? You don't go onto a boat and just go, oh, I'm on a boat, right? I'm on a oh, no, never mind. <laughs> and, um, what you do is you stand on the dock, you wait for the boat to come to you, you put one foot on, you make sure it's not rocking too much and you put the other foot on, right? It's a process, it's a gradual process. Um, you, if you jump with both feet in, you risk, the, you, you, uh, you risk rocking the boat so much that you fall into the water and then you're all wet. Um, so the idea is to get onto the boat from the dock without getting wet. And if you want something you've never had, you've gotta do something you've never done. So I started to make a plan. <laughs> So making a plan, hope's not a plan, and a goal without a plan is just a wish. Also planning to make a plan is not a plan, right? And we wanna have a SMART plan, and um, I don't know if you've seen this before, um, but SMART is a, an acronym here. So we wanna make a plan that's specific, right? It needs to be measurable. It needs to be achievable. It needs to be realistic, and it needs to be time-specific. So some examples of these. Specific, I want to quit my job and consult full-time. Measurable, I'll do this when I'm making X dollars a month. Achievable, this is an anti-example. I'll quit my job and start making a million dollars a year. Like that's, that's, I don't think, an achievable goal for many of us. Uh, another anti-pattern here. Realistic, not, I'm gonna quit tomorrow, right? That's not a good plan. And it needs to be time specific. I will do this within six months. So you put a time frame on when you want to achieve your goal. Uh, and that way you know, by putting a time, something that's time specific on it, it also becomes measurable. So you know whether or not you're hitting that goal. And then as these things change, you can then change your goals to be more in line with what's happening in your life. So I made a plan. Uh, on May 22nd, 2014, I want to travel the U.S. in a converted van full-time and skydive. So that's very specific. I'm going to do this when I'm billing 10 hours a week on the side and have my emergency fund at $20,000. I will continue to stay debt-free, both measurable and achievable. I'm going to leave my apartment in three months to go out on the road. Realistic and time-specific. So that was my goal. That's what I wanted to do with my life. So on June 25th, 2014, about a month later, I put the, uh, the plan into action and I bought a converted van. I started fixing it up, making it livable, uh, changed out the curtains because they were really ugly 90s curtains. Uh, and it helped that my next door neighbor was a seamstress. So in August 15th, 2014, I finished selling everything I owned. So that's, that's a, my apartment. And the, the table was with the apartment when I got it. So. I got in my van, and my first night I actually spent at the indoor wind tunnel in North Carolina. Um, and so this was the culmination of this three-month process of me selling everything I owned and implementing this plan that I had. And now I know a lot of people's plans are gonna be longer than three months, but I was, by the time I had made this plan, I was already at a point in my life where it was going to be achievable. Now, there are parts of the plan that 
were on a different timeline. Um, I wasn't, uh, I implemented things at different times. I didn't just um, quit my job and go out on the road because I didn't, I wasn't meeting that goal of billing 10 hours a week. And once I actually did that, uh, that's when I made the decision to give my notice at my job and uh, just do consulting full time. So let's talk a little bit about the execution of the plan. So I started moonlighting while I was working full time. And I don't, and probably not everybody here knows what moonlighting means. It basically means um, just working on the side away from your main source of income. Um, it's great that I worked for a company that allowed this and they actually encouraged it. Um, they wanted us to be able, us programmers to be able to keep our skills relevant. Uh, and the only way to really do that was to, ha to have us work on side projects and fun things. And they, they actively encouraged us to do this. Uh, so I started writing my own products for the App Store. Uh, in 2011, I actually had started a company and I was doing this. And so uh, um, I started thinking more and more about how I was going to make more money in the App Store to have that passive income. I started consulting uh, in 2014, and I got a couple clients, Infinite Red being one of them. I started engaging more with the open source community. Uh, and this was a big part of my strategy. Um, the things you get with engaging with the community is you get community recognition. Um, a lot of you probably use a lot of the code that I've written. Um, you've, uh, I, I, I don't want to speculate, but a lot of uh, RubyMotion apps in the App Store actually have code that I've written in them. Uh, and people might not even know it. But you do get community recognition from, uh, from en engaging and submitting pull requests and talking to people online about, uh, about, about RubyMotion. You get a portfolio of re reusable code so that people can go and look at your GitHub repository or look at your portfolio website and say, oh yeah, this guy has done this, 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 and this. Maybe I should hire him to help me work on stuff. You get goodwill, right? I'm a big believer in karma. What you put out into the universe, you will receive back. Um, and so um, by putting out all this uh, free stuff onto the internet, I believe that it comes back to me um, in multiple ways. Uh, and like-minded clients find you. Uh, Todd at Infinite Red actually reached out to me first. Um, I've had multiple companies reach out to me because they were using my code and they wanted, uh, they wanted me to help build, them, build something else or help build the product that they had integrated my code into. Um, so you're seeing here that I've got multiple sources of, of, of revenue coming in now. I've got my own products. I've got consulting going on here. Um, and then the final part of the execution is just take that leap. Uh, a lot of us are really afraid of change, and I was afraid of change. And so I, uh, I just decided one day, I'm going to do it. And if it, if it doesn't work, I hadn't burned those bridges. And I was going to be welcome to come back to my, company if, or my old company if I wanted to. Uh, but the big thing about engaging with the open source community, part of my strategy was to become prolific. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, I'm core contributors on all these project projects here um, and more, but these are probably the more well-known ones that I've um, contributed to a lot. Uh, and then I then I started writing my own gems. Um, a lot of you probably use motion print. Um, Reset Sim is the kind of the guts behind um, Gantz Nuclear gem. Uh, basically, just it's like a Ruby gem that resets your simulator for you. And then Gantt kind of wrapped it and did some other nice things and put rake tasks around it and stuff like that. Um, and so, and I've got lots and lots of gems. And so I tried to put as much out into the community as I could. So if you go on GitHub, and you can put, put your name in here too. And uh, I searched my name, public pull requests. So this doesn't include anything that, uh, that I commit directly to master on like my projects. Uh, it doesn't include private projects that I work on for clients. Um, and it doesn't include things that people decided they didn't like that I did. The last two years since I put this into plan, I've got 304 merged pull requests. Thank you. <laughs> and and, and like, that's the whole idea about giving back to the community. Um, I don't contribute to open source because I just want to. Like, I do it because I need something from the community and I want to give back to the community. So I need something out of bubble wrap, but I want it to do one thing a little bit different. So I modify it, I write a test, and I contribute it back. Um, so re really, um, I do a lot of the, uh, open source contributions because I need something. 
And then I realize if I need it, somebody else might need it too. Um, so you really want to just use the, the other people's hard work in your apps. And then when you do some hard work, give it back. Uh, and that's really what makes uh, a community a community, is people working together for the common good of the community. So like I said, this doesn't have to be RubyMotion. It can be any sort of technology stack. But just pick something and run with it. Uh, engage with the community, talk about, it, talk about it, talk to people, um, write code and contribute back to it. Um, and then once you've been able to take all of this, uh, this energy that you've put into it and the plans that you're putting into ac action, then you just be happy. Like, live your life and be happy. And, you know, I go to so many tech conferences and we talk tech, 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 tech. And when I went to that, uh, that security conference and they started talking about lifestyle things and how to hack your life so that you can be happier, it's like, that's really what we all want. We want to be happy. And, like, a lot of people, coding makes them happy. Making products and building things makes you happy. Um, and so there are a lot of people in the world that aren't happy. They don't like their jobs. They don't like what they're doing. Um, and you can choose to be happy. You just have to put a plan into action to do it. So I've been traveling full time in my van for almost a year. And I really just have no plans of stopping. Um, yeah, so I've got a little thing that plugs into my, my vehicle. And it's Bluetooth. And it talks to my phone. And it shows me where I've been, where I stop. Um, you can, the purple dots are um, like more than a day stop or something like that. And like the gray dots are just short stops. And you can see um, I've been traveling quite a bit in the, last, uh, in the last year. And I love it. I have no plans to stop. I'm sorry? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, probably 25,000 miles in the last year, just driving all around the country. Um, and uh, somebody pointed out to me the other day that I kind of made a narwhal shape. <laughs> So yeah, this kind of ruins it up here, but yeah, whatever. So um, I told you before that I absolutely love skydiving. So um, here's some gratuitous skydiving things because I have the microphone. Um, Mark Rickard, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I get to have awesome adventures. This is me jumping out of a hot air balloon in, uh, in Arizona. Uh, it's, it, it's something that gives me joy. And so I put a plan into action so that I could do it. And I, so that I could do the thing that makes me happy. Um, this is me. Uh, you can see skydiving, everything has to match. So my rig matches my helmet, matches my, uh, matches my suit. Um, yeah, a lot of people even match their shoelaces. It's, uh, it's quite a thing. The helmet is important, yeah. Um, in January, I achieved a goal that I had in my life to start wingsuiting. Uh, and I know you guys have all seen those videos online of people flying down mountains and stuff like that. I don't do it because that crap's dangerous. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's so much fun. And I like to call it extreme hand-holding. Yeah. Um, so I, I've got 360 jumps right now. Um, I've, uh, I did about 220 before I started wingsuiting. Um, the, the rules and regulations of uh, the governing board of skydiving rules uh, require at least 200 jumps to start wingsuiting. So I basically did it almost as soon as I could, because that was a goal when I started skydiving, is I want, I want a wingsuit. Um, I've encountered some really interesting places. Please notice the sign above Yolo County Airport. Right? So, so, so here's an aerial shot. Uh, this is all the hangar and everything here, the runway. And here's the landing area. America. Yeah. <laughs> So, and um, I, I promised uh, that I would put this slide in here. Um, Todd, you can give me my cash after, after the presentation. So, you, yeah, I mean, skydiving is great, and you get to have friends take badass photos of you hanging off airplanes, and um, yeah, and I, I do have the infinite red logo on my helmet. <laughs> uh, so, in summary, I made a li nice little flow chart for us so that we can just see. This is how I live my life. Am I happy? No? 
have a dream. Make a plan, execute the plan, and be happy. Right? Are you happy? Yeah, be happy. <laughs> it's an infinite loop. So, but I hope my, like, I, I don't, I, and Colin, I know Colin was joking, but I don't show you all these images and talk to you about my life to, like, to show how much better I am than you. It's like, uh, I want, I, I want to inspire you guys. I want to inspire you to follow your dreams, uh, do what makes you happy, and whether that's quitting your job or not. Like, I, I'm sure a lot of you love your jobs. Uh, you love what you're doing right now. Uh, but if you're not, you need to make a plan and execute a plan to be happy and to help other people and to be a good, good member of society. Um, and please contribute to open source. So uh, I know my title was uh, How to Cut Away. And uh, it's ironic because about a week and a half ago, I had my very first cutaway. Um, so here we go. There's my main parachute. And I'm spinning. And the lines are tangled. <laughs> yeah, and so I'm trying to get out of it. I'm trying to get out of it. Right? Here it goes. I check my altitude. I'm at my decision altitude right now. I, tr I, I did survive. <laughs> I try one more time, and here we go. I said, well, here it goes. There goes my parachute and my reserve coming out. And there's my reserve. So now, now I have cut away literally and figuratively. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I just want to encourage you guys to um, figure out what makes you happy, make a plan, and execute the plan. Um, no, the, each, each one of those handles are actually about $60. <laughs> no, I, I was thinking, I, literally, this was, this was, um, this was full five days before I had to come to Europe. I was thinking, if I drop these handles, I'm going to have to get new ones overnighted to be, in, to be installed so that they can repack my reserves so that I can take my parachute to Europe with me. Um, so yeah, that actually literally is what was going through my mind. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, no, you can't hear it right now because uh, because of uh, I don't have the volume up, but my you can actually hear my breathing in the in the video. It's uh, it was quite exhilarating. <laughs> but now I've done it. I know that I can survive it, and uh, I'm not going to be so scared the next time I have to do it. So. Yes, I did. Yep, two hours of walking through the w those woods that you can see underneath me, <laughs> right over here. Uh, we found we found both the main parachute and the uh, the bag that deploys the reserve. So, uh, very little. I mean, this was my 360th jump, and I I've never had to use it before. I know people that have over 10,000 jumps and have never used the reserve. Yep, yep. So, anyways, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh huh. <laughs> it was. It was. It's Jamin's fault. <laughs> uh, yeah, Laurent. Uh, there is not. No, the uh, the 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 secondary parachute is actually. Um, uh, attached to the harness that you wear. So the first one, you can cut it away, but the second one is physically attached. And if you need to cut it away, then you have to use a hook knife. Um, the, so <laughs> the, the second one is actually um, packed by an FAA certified rigger. Um, and they pack it like they would pack a base jumping canopy. So it al almost always opens on heading. It's a very fast opening. Uh, it's very reliable. The material that they're made of is more reliable. It's, um, it's, a, it's a smaller aspect ratio, which makes it a lot less fun to fly. Which, yeah, but it's a lot safer. Uh, so that's, that's the reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, so th it takes about an hour and a half to pack the reserve. Yeah. And I can pack my main in about eight minutes. So, and it's a lot more fun to fly. So. 
<laughs> no. Yeah, so... <laughs> So I actually have an app in the App Store. Um, it's, a, it's an app that allows you to find where all the drop zones are in the US. Um, and when I, when I put it up in the App Store, I set it to uh, uh, whatever uh, developer release, not a manual release, not developer release. And so I actually went up with a buddy who filmed me, and uh, I taped my phone to my arm. And I had uh, the, the iTunes Connect app open on my phone. Um, and I actually released my app, Ruby Motion app, in free fall at 11,000 feet. <laughs> so, yeah, first app ever launched in the App Store in, in free fall. Um, well, I, it was at a very, very good cellular coverage area and it was 1x service. So it's like the lowest of the low. And basically, I got out of the plane and I watched my arm on my phone until I got a cell signal. And it happened to about, about 11,000 feet, and then I pressed the buttons. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I worked 20 to 25 hours a week. Um, and that, because I'm consulting now, uh, I actually make about the same as I made at my full-time job. Uh, so I, ha I work I work less so I can travel more, but I make more uh, per per hour that I work. So. <laughs> yeah. Any, any, uh, yeah. There. The most difficult thing for me to get rid of. Um, I don't know. Probably my motorcycle. Um, because I live in a van now, it's really difficult. I could, I mean, I could get a hitch and put a motorcycle on it, but uh, that just adds to my life. And I, my goal was really to simplify. Um, so uh, my uh, my ex parent in laws had a multi million dollar house, right? Um, and every time we'd leave the house, my mother my mother in law would um, would like worry about the things in the house. And I saw that, and I'm like, man. If you just didn't have all that stuff, you wouldn't have to worry about it. And and so I, I, I really I took that philosophy and I'm like, well, I just I just don't have a lot of stuff. And but but if I get in a car accident, everything I own is gone. <laughs> so but I'm okay with that. Like if I have my laptop and my toothbrush, I'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, my toothbrush doesn't make me money. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, say that again? Right. It, it was, it wasn't steerable. Yeah, so I wouldn't have been able to land that. And, um, and, and basically, I got to an altitude at which um, I had made up my mind previously that I, would, uh, I wouldn't go below that altitude um, if I didn't have a good parachute. Uh, and for me, that was 2,500 feet. Uh, yeah, or, uh, in, in, that, in that situation, I probably would have landed in, in a 60-foot um, tree. So. Uh, under under canopy, I'm traveling about 19 miles an hour down and about uh, 20 miles an hour forward. Yeah, y yeah, that it, it would it would break a leg at least, or or an ankle or whatever. Yep. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I didn't. I actually was thinking, wow, I hope my reserve works. <laughs> Because <laughs> I don't know who packed it last, because I just dropped it off somewhere and then I picked it back up. So, but he's certified by the FAA, so I assume it's okay. <laughs> so you'd think so, but I was wearing a wingsuit, and so I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't get higher than this right here. So yeah, I have to unzip it. And when I, when you've got a malfunction happening like that, the last thing you're thinking about is unzipping your arms. So, cool. Well, I hope you guys all follow your dreams. Yeah. <laughs>